Now, a part of the Arab world that is least known, we're always focusing on Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, I mean, that's, that's where we are, uh, and maybe Egypt. But the part of the Arab world which we don't focus on very much, it doesn't make the news very often, and if it does make the news, it's on page 12, <coughs> even in the New York Times. Um, the phrase we use geographically is North Africa. Um, North Africa it is, is this area which lies along the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, it is on the edge of the world's greatest desert. The world's greatest desert is the Sahara Desert. And in fact, the Sahara does reach the Mediterranean. In Egypt and Libya, the Sahara is at the Mediterranean. You don't have to go down to the Sahara. You just have to land on the beach. The beach is very nice. It's very sandy and it's very comfortable. But it's the Sahara Desert. Uh, but farther to the west, when we come to places like Tunisia or Algeria or Morocco, there are mountains by the coast. And north of the mountains, between the mountains and the coast, there is arable land. I mean, there's water. That's the key. Uh, we may be able to ship some of our water uh, to North Africa. We've been getting a lot of it recently uh, in Michigan. So, uh, and so although it may look big on the map, it's not very big in terms of the territory. The territory is a thin strip. It's like Canada. Canada is only a thin strip that goes from Vancouver to Montreal right along uh, uh, against the uh, U.S. border. Most of what you're looking at is unoccupied, all right? So uh, it's, a, it's sort of a narrow strip that goes along uh, the Mediterranean Sea. And although it's geographically part of Africa, it's not culturally part of Africa. Because when we use the word African, we generally refer to blacks. Uh, and in fact, the people in North Africa are not black. Uh, and in fact, since they suffer from a lot of racism, they wouldn't like the word <laughs> black applied, uh, applied to them. They see themselves, although Swedes might have difficulty, they see themselves, it's all relative, right? Like young. They see themselves, <laughs> they see themselves as white, all right? And uh, as part of what we have come to call the Caucasian race. And they live on that northern shore of Africa. So they are African in a geographic sense, but they're not African in a racial or uh, cultural sense. And in fact, uh, ever since the 7th century AD, that strip along the Mediterranean has been part of the Arab and the Muslim world. That's where its culture is. Uh, which means it's part of the East, right? Because we think of the Muslim world, we think of the what? The East. But if you look at the map, you can see that parts of it in Morocco are farther west than Portugal. In fact, the shortest distance across the Atlantic, most likely, uh, with a straight line, from, your, uh, from this area, from Morocco to North Carolina. So in fact, Morocco is closer to North Carolina than it is most likely to the eastern end of the Muslim, of the Muslim world. And if you look at it in the, in the map, you see that it's not east, it's directly south of Europe. And in fact, for most of its history, it wasn't part of what we call the Eastern world. It was part of the, the Western world. It wasn't until the Arabs swept into North Africa that it culturally became part of the Eastern and Muslim world. Now, the area 
is an area that has uh, great beauty. I mean, the Sahara, if you don't stay there too long, is very, very beautiful. I mean, it, just, uh, it is. I mean, it has its own stark beauty. But north of it, the, the mountains that are to be found in North Africa, the northwest part of North Africa in Morocco and Algeria, the Atlas Mountains, are also strikingly uh, interesting and beautiful. Uh, there isn't a lot of arable land. In fact, if you're trying to raise food, most likely the best thing to have in the area are sheep and goats that don't require enormous amounts of pasture. Um, and in fact, that's why perhaps the overwhelming majority of the people who lived there in the early years were primarily herdsmen. That's how they made their living, uh, raising sheep and goats, uh, not even cows, because there wasn't enough pasture uh, for the cows. It really is the northern edge of the Sahara. Now, because it's been integrated into the Arab world, its name in the, in the Arab world, interestingly enough, is the West. It's called the West. Libya, what today are the four nations of Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. You see, all in a row along the Mediterranean, they're called the West, and the way you say West in uh, Arabic is the Maghreb. We spell it in Roman letters, M-A-G-H-R-E-B. Uh, and it's related to a, another language. In Hebrew, there's a word called ma'ariv, uh, which means uh, the evening. Uh, well, you can understand why it's the evening, because where does the sun set? In that. The sun sets in the, uh, in the west. So uh, it's called the Maghreb, and the, the Arabs who live there from Libya to Morocco are part of a cultural unit. They're the, they're the Westerners. And their Arabic, the, the dialect of Arabic, uh, is a Western dialect. So Iraqis might have difficulty fully understanding the Maghrebis. The Maghrebis would have difficulty, what, understanding the... Uh, Iraqis. The borders that now exist were basically imposed by conquerors, European conquerors in recent years, because they are the borders of colonies. Libya belonged to Italy. Tunisia belonged to France. Algeria belonged to France. Morocco belonged to, to France. So the boundaries you have there are the boundaries left over from what the French and the Italians decided. But basically, it's a unified area, and we can call it the Maghrebi. The, the, the Arabs who are there are the Maghrebi. Now, what I want to do is to give you a sense of its story, its transformation because that will enlighten us as to what we confront in this part of the Arab world. The foundation of, of it all is a race of people who still survive in large numbers in the area and whose genes dominate. The, the people, the Maghrebi Arabs, look very different from the ones in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the ones in Saudi Arabia have a very strong Semitic origin. The people in the Maghreb uh, don't. Indeed, uh, Arabs came into the area and they conquered it, but they conquered a race that had been living there for hundreds and thousands and thousands of years. Now, their name was a name given to them by the Greeks. Uh, they call themselves the wonderful people. The Greeks called them the barbarians. <laughs> you know, because everybody was foreign. The word barbaros in Greek means foreign, that's all. So barbaroi are the what? You're, you know, you're a foreigner. Well, a foreigner, you know what a foreigner is. Okay. So, um, so from barbaroi comes the word uh, barbar or bear bear, all right? So they're called the bear bears. 
B-E-R, B-E-R-S, that's their name outside of Bear Bear Land. Sometimes British style, they're called, like Derby Darby, no, no, uh, they're called Barbars. And so we call the coast, the Maghreb is called the Barbary. That's where the, that's where the name, the Barbary Coast, comes from. I mean, that is, that's the original Barbary Coast, not a saloon in San Francisco or whatever. Okay, so. Uh, that's the Barbary Coast, and these are the people, and you can see, you see them. They, they have high foreheads. Uh, they are certainly what I would call dark white. The, the Caucasian race has, shares what we call features of the face, but the colors vary. In uh, Central and Northern Europe, they tend to be what we call very pink. And then in Southern Europe and North Africa, they tend to be darker. I mean, they're the, the, the different shades. This is dark white, but they have high foreheads. Many of them have blue eyes. I mean, I wouldn't recommend that you spend time staring into their eyes because staring at people is uh, considered to be hostile and provocative, but you can't avoid seeing it. I mean, there's a distinction. Uh, so they have the... The blue, uh, the blue eyes, and they also tend to have, uh, in what we call Syria, Iraq, and even Saudi Arabia, the people often have what I call the, it's brachycephalic, it's wide head, with uh, a, a kind of flat in the back. Uh, these people are what we call dolichocephalic. You just see they're, they're very, you can see it when you go to Paris and you see the Algerians in Paris. They're, they're different in form. Very narrow, thin-skulled, all right. Uh, it's a different, I mean, it is. It's racially different. They're both integrated into the Arab world, but these people weren't Arabs to begin with. They were bear bears. And they stretched all the way from Egypt to the Atlantic. They were, they are the Maghrebi, they are the people of uh, the West. Their language is related to ancient Egyptian. Egyptian and Berber belong to a family of languages that we call Hamitic. Uh, at one time, most likely, Semitic languages and Hamitic languages uh, had the same root, but they diverged thousands of years ago, and now they are separate. So this is an area that has what we call a native population. They're called the Bear Bears, and in many places, they are still there and identify themselves as such. And they still speak Berber. If you go to Mo Morocco, for instance, you hear it. If you go up into the Kabyl, into the, the mountains in Algeria, in central Algeria, you will hear Berber. Uh, one form of cultural intimidation, of course, that occurred in the area is they never wrote down their language. Because when they were conquered, they hadn't yet uh, written down their language. And in fact, uh, they were told that Berber was not something to be written down. They became Muslims, and in Islam, the sacred language was Arabic. So the language of high culture is Arabic. Bear, bear, you just speak. You don't what? You don't write it. But in recent years, actually, in the bear, bear world, they are beginning to, uh, to write it down. And uh, so there are changes. But they're there. And most of the people in the Maghreb are of bear, bear origin. You can just tell that by looking at them. They're like the people you will see in Paris and Marseille and Lyon. They look very different from the people from Syria and, uh, and Iraq. Now, what did they do for a living? Well, what do we know about their culture? Well, we uh, know something about their culture from ancient documents. Uh, they were divided up into small clans and tribes, and they fought each other all the time. What's new? <laughs> and uh, they were famous for an animal. Uh, the bear bears were very deeply attached to the horse. And uh, when they went into battle, they rode the horse. And they carried wooden javelins. They didn't have what we call hand-to-hand -hand combat. They would ride their horse up to you, and they would throw their wooden javelin, and then they would what? <laughs> then they would, they would withdraw. 
hopefully the wooden javelins would take care of you. If it didn't, too bad. All right, so. Uh, they uh, wore uh, pantaloons with a small, as described by ancient writers, a small white, uh, white vest. And uh, they were herdsmen. They were not generally engaged in farming. Even though they were in farming areas, they preferred to be herdsmen. That was regarded as the, the most prestigious way of growing food or making food. So there they are. They've been there for thousands of years. They've lived in the area. Uh, and in fact, when they first encounter other cultures and civilizations, they have not yet acquired the use of metal which is very interesting, because one of the reasons why foreigners want to come to their place is it's loaded with metals <laughs> that they need. Uh, now, the level two of what we call North Africa has to do with the people who are fascinating. Um, I first encountered them in Latin class, because there was this wonderful Roman called Scipio, or Scipio as we say in English, who kept saying, you know, uh, Carthage must be destroyed. And I knew about Carthage, Missouri, but I knew that isn't where it started. So uh, Carthage is the name of a great city. And in fact, uh, it was founded in the 9th century BC in the Maghreb in uh, what we call the West. Uh, today, Carthage is a fashionable suburb of Tunis. So while you're walking through the Bloomfield Hills of Tunis, there are archaeological uh, ruins that you have to walk by. I mean, in fact, Bloomfield Hills would be more interesting if there were a few what? You know, archaeological ruins right, right in, the, in the middle of it. Um, the Carthaginians were ethnically Phoenician. They belonged to a people that lived in what today is uh, Israel or Palestine or Lebanon, that's where they lived. Their name in the Bible is familiar. The Greeks call them Phoenician because they extracted a purple dye from seashells and created the most expensive fabric in the world. The Phoenician purple, the way you say Phoenician or purple in uh, Greek is phoenix or phoenix. So they're called the purple people. I mean, that's, that, that's the Greeks called The Greeks called foreigners, purple people. What, what do the Greeks care? I mean, they had, they had all these names for, uh, for foreigners. So they're called the purple people. But in the Bible, they're called the Kna'anim, the Canaanites. And we know a lot about the Canaanites from the Bible. We're always talking about the Canaanites, right? They have to be exterminated. They have to be defeated. They have to be crushed. Well, the, the Phoenicians are the Canaanites. And the Canaanite language is the Phoenician language. And the other thing is that the language of the Hebrews is Canaanite. It's one and the same language. Almost no variation. So these people spoke Phoenician slash Canaanite slash Hebrew. And they had five great cities, commercial cities. Uh, one, three of them we were familiar with, Tyre, as we say it in English, uh, uh, Sidon, or Sidon, and uh, Beirut. And so, and they were the, the traders of the Mediterranean. Since the Egyptians were not interested in going into the water, uh, the Phoenicians became the great trading people of first the Eastern Mediterranean and then looking for metal, gold, silver, and because it was the Bronze Age, bronze is a mixture of copper and tin, you need tin, they came looking for tin over here, and they found some of it in Portugal, and in fact, the Phoenician ships went all the way up to, most likely, Ireland, into the Atlantic. They were intrepid people, and 
they had a problem. The problem was that a great empire was being organized in northern Iraq called the Assyrians. And the Assyrians were on the move. We know that from the Bible. And the Assyrians now are moving toward Phoenicia. And as the Phoenicians realize they're going to be conquered, a plan appears in Tyre. Uh, the daughter of the king of Tyre, that's the legend, whether that's the way it happened, I don't know. Her name is Alyssa, which is now one of the most popular names for grandchildren. I cannot tell you. <laughs> you. You can raise your hand if your grandchild is named Alyssa. Just raise, anybody have a grandchild named Alyssa? That's, it. that's her name, okay? She was the first Alyssa, all right? And uh, so Alyssa, now uh, the daughter of the king of Tyre, goes with an expedition. And in fact, they come to a place where the Phoenicians had already done trade, uh, a very crucial spot because it controls the passage from the eastern Mediterranean to the western Mediterranean because right here where Tunis is, where Carthage is, or be, uh, there's a very narrow space between Sicily and Tunis and you what? You can control the Mediterranean. Right there, they established a city called uh, its name in Phoenician Hebrew is Karta Hadasha, which means new city. The Romans couldn't say it. So by the time they got through with it, you know what happened. Uh, by the time they got through with it, Karta Hadasha turned into Car Cartago. Oh, that's, that's funny. So, and Cartago turned into the English uh, Carthage. The, the language of the city was Phoenician Hebrew. And it became a great city. Uh, they landed. They negotiated with the bear bears who were around. They actually paid rent for four centuries until they got tired of paying rent. They paid rent to the bear bears. They established the city. And this became the new Phoenicia because the old Phoenicia was captured. This became the new Phoenicia, and now they had a new base of operations. They take most of Sicily, they take Sardinia, they take the coast of Spain, they take parts of Portugal, they go through the Straits of Gibraltar, the whole thing. They are the great power of the Western Mediterranean. A nation moved. And now their culture is added to that of the bear bears. Most of the people are what? Bear bears. But the people of what we call technology, urban sophistication, whatever, are the Carthaginians. And we know about their culture. They, they were fantastic at the making of textiles. We have evidence of their jewelry uh, and some of their pottery. Their religion featured the worship of two gods that are to be found in the Bible. In the Bible, they are being denounced right and left, left and right. Uh, but they were certainly given deities, powerful deities. Uh, one is the great god of rain, who obviously is residing in Michigan presently. <laughs> uh, we don't need a god of rain, do we? No, that's up. Uh, they do. His name is Baal. And uh, his sister, with whom he has incestuous relationships, gods are allowed to do this, right. uh, is the goddess of fertility, because together they are going to create what? Fertility. Uh, her name, in, uh, in the Bible, she's called Anat. But in uh, Carthage, she was called Tanit. It's another name that, you, uh, uh, that you'll see, Tanit. So Baal and Tanit. And uh, they were the, the, the great gods. There were great temples. Uh, Baal's temple was always on top of a mountain. And her shrines were always in groves of trees. That's why in the Bible, you're always supposed to cut down the trees and destroy the pillars on tops of mountains. So, and the religion featured human sacrifice. One of the interesting things that you find when you go to a little museum in Carthage are little bottles which contain the skeletal remains of babies that were sacrificed and uh, uncovered in what we call the archaeological ruins. This child sacrifice is referred to in the 
in the Bible. It's a, so you're suddenly having, the Canaanites have just moved west. They went from Detroit to Phoenix. Okay, but so. So here, so here they are, and they become enormously rich. After a while, they become so powerful, they conquer the hinterland. And they enslave the bear bears. And they enter into agriculture, and vineyards are planted, and olive yards are planted. And they establish Carthaginian or Phoenician colonies all along the coast of the Mediterranean and even beyond the Straits of Gibraltar. And then comes the Great War, which is to change uh, the Maghreb. A people now appears in the Western Mediterranean as a rival to the Carthaginians. They arise in Italy. Uh, initially, they are friendly to the Carthaginians because they fear them. And then they become unfriendly because they become stronger. They're named the Romans. And one of the things anybody knows, I mean, if you go to school, all right, is the war between what Rome and Carthage. It breaks out in the third century BC, and the war lasts for 160 years with intermittent truces. Sounds like other wars that we know, right? Uh, this goes on and on and on. The heart of the war is that the leader of Carthage, who has a Hebrew or Phoenician name, Chani Baal, let Baal be gracious, or Hannibal, as we say, all right? Uh, so Chani Baal, uh, now takes an army with elephants and he cr uh, crosses the Straits of Gibraltar, he goes through Spain, he crosses the Pyrenees and he crosses the Alps and enters Italy in an area where the enemies of the Romans, the Celts, are located in what today is northern Italy and then descends as a surprise into Italy. I mean, there's the, uh, and in fact he crushes the Roman army. But he has overextended supply lines. The end of the war is known. I'm not going to press it, but the Carthaginians lose, despite a splendid beginning for them. And the Romans ultimately uh, recover their power and pursue the Carthaginians. And the next thing you know, they have taken Carthage. The year is 146 BC, and they burn it to the ground. I've never understood how you can burn stone cities. Uh, and then I discovered that if you're using things like limestone, if you heat it, ultimately it just what? Pops. And uh, so they burned the city to the ground, left it a ruin, and now the Maghreb becomes Roman. It's part of the West. Latin settlers come to live there. In fact, a dialect of Latin, which is called Punic Latin. Punic is the Roman way of saying Phoenician. So it's obviously Latin with a Phoenician accent. All right. The way French is Latin with a Celtic accent, so this is with a Phoenician accent. Whatever it is, a whole dialect of Latin develops here. It's part of the Roman world. However, the Phoenician language, the Canaanite language, persists. And in fact, Canaanite culture persists and Canaanite religion persists. But now it's intermingled with the arrival of uh, the Latins, and this becomes an important part of the Roman Empire. And the Romans divide uh, it up into three provinces. What today is Libya and Tunisia is the Roman province of Africa. What today is, uh, is Algeria was the Roman province of Numidia. And what today is Morocco was the Roman province of Mauritania. So there you are. And in fact, there are fantastic Roman ruins in uh, North Africa. It was part of the Roman Empire. It makes sense. It's, it's part of the Mediterranean world, isn't it? 
Well, that was not going to last forever because the Roman Empire itself was invaded from the north by Germans. Among the German nations to the north, there were the Goths, the Bavarians, the Saxons, the Franks, one of the nations that lived between Berlin and Warsaw was a nation called the Vandals. It's an interesting name, isn't it? The Vandals now invade the Roman Empire, uh, driven uh, westward by the Huns who are invading from Asia. They enter what today is called France, what was called Gaul. They come down from through Gaul, they cross the Pyrenees, they enter Spain, they wreak havoc, and then their leader is a man called Genseric. And Genseric leads them across the Straits of Gibraltar. And they invade North Africa, and they take it from the Romans. And in fact, the Romans have already rebuilt Carthage as a Roman city. And they take the Roman city, and now, uh, the whole of North Africa is run by Germans. The Vandals are Germans, and the Vandals won't marry outside their group. Once they settle down, uh, they become as Spiro Agnew. Do you remember him? <laughs> Spiro Agnew was our beloved vice president a, a long time ago. He used the word effete. Remember that? It was accusation against liberals. They were effete. So, but in, in fact, the Vandals, through luxury, become what? Uh, effete and, but along the way, they become very rich because this is where, they, where the word Vandal turns into Vandal. They became raiders. They built a navy and any ship that went through the Mediterranean, do you understand, they went out and they seized it. That was the source of their wealth, piracy. But it wasn't going to last because in the 7th century A.D. came the force that was to change the whole nature of the Maghreb, of North Africa. In fact, to move North Africa <coughs> from the Western world into the Eastern world. It became part of what we call the Eastern Empire. <coughs> coming out of Arabia, fired up by a new religion called Islam. Uh, the Arabs now pour out of Arabia. First, <coughs> they defeat the Persians, they take Iraq and Iran, then they manage almost simultaneously to take uh, Syria and what today is Lebanon and uh, Israel, Palestine, and then they march into Egypt and they take Egypt, and they're on a roll. So they send a kind of an expedition uh, into the Maghreb, uh, and they meet the Berbers. They initially defeat them, but they have overextended. It is not until the year 670, 30 years after the first expedition, that they come back in force. There are now thousands and thousands of Bedouin and Arabs and whatever who are now part of the army looking for new land, and they now sweep again out of Egypt into what today is Western Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco, and they take it. They defeat the Berbers. And then on a roll, <coughs> they cross over into Spain and they take Spain. And then on the roll, they cross the Pyrenees into France or Gaul. And it is there that they are stopped in the famous Battle of Tours. They've overextended their lines. And in fact, when they arrive finally in France, uh, the weather changes and they encounter something that they were not familiar with, which discombobulated them. It was called snow for us, but for them, uh, there it was. And so they withdraw to the Pyrenees, and now this whole western area, and you have to understand that the west also included Spain. Do you understand? It was all, that was all part of this. So Spain now becomes part of the eastern world because the capital of this whole thing is back here in Iraq in Baghdad. 
first Medina, then Damascus, then Baghdad, but that's where it is. It's part of the Eastern Empire. And from that point on, the culture of North Africa ceases to be Western, do you understand? And becomes Eastern. It enters into the Muslim world. Well, this area is a problematic area, and let me tell you why. Because the tension still exists. Anybody who goes to the area can see it. The Arabs conquered a people called the Berbers. And when they first conquered them, there was a controversy within the Arab world. And uh, it's a controversy that uh, still continues. You can see it in the Sudan between what we call white Arabs and uh, black Muslims. All right? the, the war that's going on now in the, in the Sudan. Uh, do you grant equal rights to conquered people even if they become Muslim? Now, theoretically, they are entitled to what? Equal rights. But they're not Arab, they're what? They're bare, bare. And what happened for a century and a half, which poisoned relations between the Arabs and the Berbers, was that they enslaved thousands of the Berbers who became Muslim. And so the, the hostility between the two peoples was very strong. And for 150 years, uh, the Arabs were ruling over a Muslim population that wasn't very happy about Arab rule. So now, what happened in the Maghreb is the rebellion. And this rebellion is a continuous theme in the area uh, between Arabs and Berbers. It's, uh, it will never be resolved. There are, what, what happens is you, you develop three groups of people. Arabs, who can uh, perhaps trace their ancestry back to the people who came out of Arabia. Then you have what we call Arabized Berbers. These are Berbers who speak Arabic okay, and do their work in Arabic, in the way the Irish speak English. Right? Do the Irish become English because they speak English? Well, they don't think so. So, uh, but they, they do their world in Arabic, and they're intimidated culturally because Arabic is regarded as the, the sacred, superior, high culture language, the whole thing, and their language don't even write. So they can speak both. Now, most of the people that we call Moors, the word Moor is related to the word Maghreb, they're the Westerners, right? Most people we call Moors aren't Arabs, they're Arabized. Bear bears. And then the third group are those people who remained up in the hills and continued to use bear bear as their chief uh, language. They're still around. You can see them, you can hear them or see them in Morocco, or you can see them in Kabylia in, in Algeria. They're still there. So from the very beginning, the tension creates instability, and the instability leads to rebellion. Now the bear bears are now Muslims, so the the, the reasons they give for their rebellion are always Muslim. And the reason is a, is a justified one. This government isn't treating us as a Muslim government ought to. Racism! Oh, well. So, shortly after the acquiring of the Maghreb, uh, two-thirds of it is an active rebellion. And they, they just establish all kinds of independent little states, kingdoms, whatever, under Bear Bear uh, leadership. Some of these Bear Bears only speak Bear Bear. Some of these Bear Bears speak Arabic, whatever else it is. And they're influenced by a movement that comes out of Arabia. It's called the Khariji. And the movement is sort of fundamentalist. It it's basically says, uh, if you surrender to Allah, if you surrender to God, then indeed what? You shall be treated as an equal. And in fact, all these power-hungry 
uh, Arabs or rulers who don't follow that strict rule, they're not authentic Muslims. So, so now they have a religious reason, but now what enters into the Bear Bear world is what I would call a kind of fundamentalism because attached to the Kharijis was not only equality, attached to the Kharijis was a deep hatred of sophisticated urban civilization. And that will be resolved by something very, very interesting. Uh, in the 10th century, a man arrives in uh, Tunisia or Carthage. Carthage by now is a ruin. What has replaced Carthage is an Arab military camp turned into a city like Baghdad. Baghdad was an Arab military camp turned into a city. So this is called Karwan, and Karwan is one of the great cities of the Arab world. And it's not too far from Tunis uh, or Carthage. It's a great visit if you go there. I enjoyed mine. It was a, it's a walled city. It's still it's a, it's a great tourist attraction. So, but Karwan was a real city, and he gets to Karwan, and he is the leader of another group of dissident Muslims and Arabs. They're called Shiites. Now one of the reasons for the rise of the Shiite religion in Iraq was for the same reason. The Arab conquerors refused to deal with converts as equals. And the Shiite rebellion, to a large degree, was a rebellion against the established Arab government that was, in their minds, guilty of uh, ethnic hatred. And so he arrives with a similar message. And the next thing you know is he goes up into the mountains where the bear bears are, he mobilizes all the bear bears, he turns them into an army, and now, uh, with a Shiite leader who claims to be a descendant of Muhammad, They sweep into Karwan, they take it, and then this army sweeps all the way to Egypt. I mentioned them last week. They're called the Fatimids because the daughter of Muhammad was Fatima. So if you're descended from Muhammad, you're descended from the daughter also, right? That's the, the line. So the Fatimid dynasty, they sweep into Egypt and their headquarters is over here in the market. They come out of the West. And the people in Baghdad are going crazy because they're seizing this whole part of the empire. In fact, they create a whole new capital called Cairo. So the Maghreb is not one of those places that um, is unimportant. It's important in the Arab story, and in particular for another reason. Spain, to a large degree, Arab Spain, was an extension of the Maghreb. There it is. And very early in its Arab history, uh, it was visited by a refugee from the Middle East uh, who became the leader of the Arab Spain and seceded from the empire. Now, in Spain, the problem of the Arabs was very clear. In Spain, they didn't deal with simply bear bears. The bear bears had been converted to Islam. In Spain, they were dealing with what were called Ladinos. Ladinos are the, the ancestral people of the Spanish and the Portuguese. The Ladinos are people who speak Latin of some kind a variation thereof that will turn into Spanish and Portuguese, and are Christian. And the overwhelming majority of the people are Christian. In order to strengthen their hold on the country, the Arabs bring in from the East um, a people who share their enemy. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. They're the Jews. So now the Jews come all, they pour all the way across North Africa, they pour into Spain, and there's an alliance between Arabs and, 
You have to remember that when you think of history, by the way. <laughs> There's an alliance between Arabs and Jews in Spain, and uh, the people that have to be kept down, however, are the Ladino Christians. Well, as we know, as I frequently say from the movies, that is an unstable situation. Uh, soon the Ladino Christian population will rise up. And they will be led by a great figure. Uh, Charlton Heston played Moses, and he also played El Cid. Do you remember El Cid? Oh, yes. The great liberator, and he now, the whole thing. So now they all rise up, and now they're pushing the Arabs out of Spain. How will they stop it? Well, the first thing they do is they send, a, the, the Arabs send a distress signal to whom? The Berbers. So now pouring out of Morocco and Algeria are all these bear bears. They pour into Spain and they try to push back the Christians. But there aren't enough and in fact tensions now break out between the Arabs and the bear bears and whatever. All right. And then it happens. Uh, in the 11th century, a group appears, perhaps this is the great moment of the Maghreb, to, to tell you about this empire. Uh, it's not an, an Arab empire, it's a bear bear. One of the most important things for North Africa, opportunities, I'll tell you, is called crossing the Sahara. Because if you cross the Sahara, there is gold, lots of gold. Uh, and in fact, initially, the uh, bear bears, when they had horses, used pack horses. They would cross with lots of water attached to the horses, and then they would stop at oases. It would take a long time. But once the camel came, they found a way to cross, and in fact, many bear bears became involved in what we call the Trans-Sahara trade and became very rich in it. Uh, over here in what today is Mauritania, there emerged a group of bear bears who were very rich from the Trans-Sahara trade and by virtue of the religion that had spread in the Maghreb, very fundamentalist. They ultimately received the name or took the name, the Al-Muravids, and now they received a message. Come to Spain to rescue the Arabs, the Muslims. So this bear bear kingdom moved north. It basically took Morocco and most of what today is Algeria, crossed over into Spain and gave Charlton Heston and the Christian armies, do you understand, a what to? Push them back. The problem was, and this of course is a problem that still exists in the Muslim world, it even exists in the Christian world, they were frighteningly fundamentalist. And Arab life in Spain was very sophisticated. So uh, the hostility between the two became very, very intense, but the Almoravids didn't last for a long time. There was rivalry with another bear bear group. This group is called the Al Muqaddis, and the Al Muqaddis come basically out of uh, eastern Algeria, and they move in, they defeat the Almoravids, they absorb them, and then they also enter into Spain. They take, uh, they push the Christians all the way back to Toledo, to Toledo. And then they issue, of course, a decree, which was opposed by many of the people in the Arab world. But it's one of the tensions. They're fundamentalist. What fires them up to fight the way they do is what? Their fanatic religion. So they issue a decree saying 
that nobody who is not a Muslim can live in our territory. And in fact, thousands of Christians and Jews converted to Islam, and thousands of them became refugees. One of them is a man from Cordova, who at the age of 13 left and moved to Cairo, a much more sophisticated Arab environment. His name is Maimonides. So, so now there, but, the, but what's, what's happened here is, for the first time since the Carthaginians, do you understand? There is uh, a powerful kingdom, and for the first time in Bear Bear history, they are the dominant political force in the Maghreb. But it won't last, and so I have to explain now what I call the decline. That, that, by the way, is the supreme moment. The supreme moment is the whole Maghreb is united, and the leaders are Muslim and fundamentalist and Berber. Well, what happens is that the Spanish, despite the setback, and the Portuguese, complete the reconquest of their area. By 1492, they have driven the Muslims, Arab and Berber, out of Spain. They have expelled the Jews, and now, having done that, their ambition now is to restore the Maghreb to Western and Christian control. So, for a century and a half, Spanish and Portuguese armies, this is the 16th century, invade the Maghreb. They take Algiers, they take Tunis, they, I mean, they, they land. You, you can see where they landed because some of the cities have either Spanish or Portuguese names. They're old settlements. Casablanca is not Arabic. Is it? And it's not French either. So they establish, and, and they're making a mess out of this whole place. The only force now that can restrain the Spanish, the French can't, and the English can't, because, and the Germans can't, because maybe they don't want to because they're Christian, but they're all caught up in a war between Catholics and Protestants. They're, just, they're killing each other up there. And, and, you know, they don't have any time for this. So now there emerges a force to drive out the Spanish. They're called the Turks. And in the 16th and 17th century, the Ottoman Turks now appear with their fleets in the Mediterranean. They confront Spain. And now what they do is they send Turks into what today is Tunisia, Libya, and Algeria to drive out the Spanish. By the end of the 17th century, the Maghreb now has a new conqueror. They're Muslim, but they're not Arab, and they're not what? And they're not Berber. They're Turks. They're like the Mamelukes, you know, uh, that, you, that ended up in Egypt, either from the Caucasus or Turks. I mean, they're, and in fact, they marry with each other. And they're always bringing Turkish recruits into the area now to run the place. So now let me tell you about the heap. At the bottom are the bear bears. They're always at the bottom. In the middle are the Arabs. And on top are the Turks. So how are they going to make a living? Well, there are various things you could do. You could open up, you can't open up a vineyard, can you? This is, this is a great place for vineyards, because vineyards produce alcoholic beverages, and Islam forbids alcoholic beverages. Out with vineyards, OK. But you can do olive yards, can't you? And maybe some other, no, 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 no. 
the economy of these people who are essentially soldiers of fortune under the Turks is to resume what the Vandals did, piracy. So now, any ship, do you understand, British, French, whatever, going through the Mediterranean, now all out of the Barbary Coast, do you understand, come these Corsairs, whatever, and they assault the place. Well, they make a lot of money, by the way. There are several operas uh, that, are no, that have the theme of uh, the Barbary pirates who take some maiden from a, uh, a European ship, you know, the, the, whole, the whole story. Well, that's the Barbary coast, and in fact, the Turkish rulers are making money. But the population, Arab and Berber, gets almost nothing from it and what? Shrinks, 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 shrinks. The place becomes an economic dump. Well, we've now reached the 19th century. If you look at the map and you're interested in real estate, If you think of Europe as Wayne County and North Africa as Oakland County, <laughs> no, 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 do you understand? I'm, I'm trying to give you a sense. Do you want to, it's right there. It isn't like, it's not in the East. You see, they say the Middle East. It's not. It's what? It's a hop, skip, and jump right across the Mediterranean. Now, the people who become most fascinated with the opportunity of taking it are the French. The British already have a what? A big empire. The Germans haven't yet unified. The Italians haven't gotten their act together. The Russians are off conquering Siberia, do you understand? I mean, they're, they're moving eastward. They don't have any time for this in Central Asia. And the Americans don't need it because what? They're heading for California, so, so the whole thing. This is. The French are obsessed because the French, who have this sense of being the greatest people in the world, and maybe they are, I don't know. The French now want an empire. They tried with Louis XIV and failed. They tried with Napoleon and what? Failed. Now they want an empire, and now this is easy picking. So, what happens is, in 1827, the envoy, the, there was, there's always what we call the complaint department. The French and the Spanish and the British and the Americans would always end up sending somebody to complain to these Barbary pirates. And so this Frenchman is sent, and he is insulting in his demeanor toward the, the day of Algiers, the Turkish governor representing the Ottoman Sultan. So the day gets angry and with his whisk, you know, one of these whisks. I've never had one, but I've, <laughs> I've seen it in the movies. You know, a whisk. He brushes the cheek of the French envoy, who then screams in French, Oi! <laughs> Insult! And goes back to Paris. Now, now the French have an excuse. Don't they have an excuse? Of course. Now an excuse for war. Uh, you don't, they didn't need to find chemical, biological weapons, nothing. The, the excuse was, no, no, do you understand? The whisk. How dare this savage, do you understand, use his whisk against. So the next thing you know, a French army lands. And once landed, they don't leave. They will take, with the exception of Libya, the whole West. And they will make it the foundation of the new French Empire. First they take Algeria. You have to wait until 1881 before they take Tunisia. And the excuse they use is they don't want to, but the Italians will if they don't. Thank you, Will. Okay. <laughs> and then in 1912 they will take Morocco, and their excuse there is, well, they don't want it, but if they don't, the Germans will. Okay. Isn't that a good excuse? But they have Algeria the longest. 
And Algeria is a very interesting story because its story parallels the story of Zionism. Because the French decide not simply to rule Algeria, they decide to annex it in a permanent way. The way to annex it in a permanent way is what happened in North America. How did, we, how did the Europeans annex North America? We're all from Europe. They sent people over, didn't they? What if people didn't come over? What if we only had the fur trade with the Indians? Well, if that were the case, they would be letting us open casinos. No, no. <laughs> No, they, no, they, 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 would, no, they would be in charge. No, I mean, you, 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 we drove them out and we killed them. No, 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 we would, that's what happens. That's a, we settled here right? and we're here and we're not leaving, are we? So, uh, so now they bring French settlers. This is very interesting. Talking about the westernization of the Maghreb. The way to transform it is to bring in European French settlers. And so starting, it takes them about 20 years to put down all the rebellions, and then already by the 1850s while they're doing Offenbach in Paris, settlers arrive. Uh, the defeat of Napoleon III triggers an, a big migration. A French province by the name of Elsass is given to the Germans, and many of the French living in Elsass don't want to live under the Germans. So they want to have some place to go, so the French move them to Algeria. One, one of the things that they do in Elsass is wine. So now in a Muslim country, the French, well they always do that, right, are planting vineyards. Wine, 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 grapes, 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 the whole thing. I mean, alcohol is now flowing, and they're settling down, and they take Algiers, and they walk into Algiers, and of course they say, what a dump. And the next thing you know is there's an old city which is called the Caspa, which is reserved for tourists. <laughs> and then there's the new city with you know, apartment buildings and the beach, the plage, and the whole thing. I want to tell you, if you went to Algiers in 1925, it was more beautiful than Marseille. It just was. It was a European, do you understand? Was there, was a, uh, there was what we call the Arab section, and then there was the European section, and it was what? It was gorgeous, and there were thousands and thousands. There were close to a million and a half French living there. And they would say, Algeria is France. And they changed the whole culture. They built universities, they built infrastructures, they built the roads, school systems, and then they offered French citizenship to the natives. Well, but in order, see, France is now a secular state. In order to become a French citizen, you have to pledge allegiance to the French state and the French constitution as your supreme authority. Now the Jews, eager to get out of what we call persecution, pledged immediately. So they all became citizens. But Muslims had a problem because if you're, uh, you know, if you're what we call a religious Muslim, not a cultural Muslim, I mean, I mean, after all, your supreme authority is Allah. You can't, you can't accept the constitution of the French secular state as your what? as your supreme authority. So the French found a way to exclude. So, you ever get an offer where you know they're not really, really serious? Right? It was an offer that wasn't really serious, and so most of the Muslims didn't become French citizens and didn't even vote, and the French would say, well, we, we gave you a chance. But now you have to see the instability here. Most of the Turks are gone. But now you have at the top, got the top? At the top are les Francais, the, the French. And they like being there. It's like being in California. <laughs> Under them are what we call the minorities. The French use the minorities in order to control the majority. 
One of the groups that did fared very well in Algeria under the French were the Jews. So, there we go. Okay. so they're, they're part of what we call the minorities. Then under them are the Arabs. And under the Arabs, guess who? Who's always at the bottom? The Bear Bears, they are always at the bottom. So I got the structure. It's already unstable, and uh, it becomes more and more unstable because the population of Algeria explodes, as does Tunisia and Morocco, because Western technology and medicine arrive, and even though you have overwhelming poverty, there it is. And then comes the moment when France is defeated by the Germans and a government arrives in France that allies itself with the Germans in the Second World War. It's the government of Maréchal Pétain. Stalin is screaming for a second front. Roosevelt says, calm down. We're not invading Europe. We're not ready to. What we're going to do is in steps. We can't invade Europe because our southern flank is what? Vulnerable. North Africa is under the French, and the French government is theoretically allied with the Germans. What we're going to do is take North Africa. There may be people in this room, I don't know, who were in that invasion in 1900, and remember November 1942, the Americans end up in the Maghreb. They land in Ingrid Bergman, Humphrey Bogart territory, you know, in Casablanca. No, no. And they meet uh, General Rommel, do you remember? And they had this big battle. It's all being fought over here. In the interim, between or just before the First World War, Libya, which had been under Turkish control, was taken because the Italians now wanted to have, they had to have an empire. Ooh. So they took Libya. And in fact, uh, Libya became part of the war scene because you may remember uh, Mussolini, to demonstrate that he was significant, would take the Italian army periodically into Egypt, and then they get pushed back, and then finally the Germans had to come and rescue them. But it was all made uh, impossible for the Germans and the Italians by the arrival of the Americans. And the next thing you know is the Americans arrive, and North Africa is liberated. And Charles de Gaulle shows up. Roosevelt and Churchill, if you said de Gaulle to either of them, do you understand? Nausea. <laughs> Instant nausea. He now shows up and says, we have liberated, we, who's we? What, 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 we? <laughs> no, we have liberated North Africa. I am the legitimate. OK, Charles. But now there's a problem. The way you rule, you, you, you can never have enough police or soldiers to control anything. And you can see that in Iraq now. What you need is intimidation power. Now, what is very interesting about the British in India was the British controlled, at that time, 500 million Indians with 100,000 British troops. It couldn't be because they had British police in every little village. It had, the, the effect was they viewed the British as powerful. It's called intimidation power. They respected their power. But now the Arabs don't respect the French power. And now they want their what? Their independence. Something has now arrived on the Arab scene. It's called Arab nationalism. And you know the Americans are talking about freedom for everybody. So the French come back, but now you can see what's happening. Rebellion. The Arabs rise up in rebellion against the French, which was to produce the rebellion begins in 1954, shortly after the end of the Second World War. I mean, they're, they're not intimidated by them anymore. And not only that, in the middle of the rebellion are a million and a half Frenchmen who live, do you understand? Live there. 
who regard themselves as being in France. To ease the situation, by 1956, the French let go of Tunisia and Morocco. But they hang on to Algeria. That's, that's France. Don't we have all those French people? Isn't this our land? Didn't we build Algiers? Didn't we build all these, the ports and the infrastructure and the whole thing? This is our place. Which is now to produce one of the most interesting alliances of all given the present relationship between Israel and France. The state of Israel now comes into existence about the same time, right? An expression of Jewish nationalism. And she needs allies. Who is her strongest ally in the 1950s? France, because the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? The French are fighting this rebellion in Algeria, and the Israelis are fighting, I mean, they're fighting the Arabs here, the Israelis are fighting the Arabs there. So the major source of military equipment for the Israelis comes from France. But it's futile. And I'll tell you why. Another war broke out in 1945 before the Second World War end ended. It's called the Cold War. The war between America and Russia. And now you've got a force over here that is willing to supply any rebel force, do you understand, with arms. Well, they recently revived, I don't know whether you saw it, it was shown the local theaters, the Battle of Algiers. Did anybody see the Battle of Algiers? It was, it was redone. It's, it's a fantastic, fantastic movie. Uh, in the end, the French try repression, torture, whatever. They call all the people who are rebelling against them terrorists. French settlers are killed. And in the end, The French can't hold on. They try with the British and the Israelis to uh, get rid of Nasser, and they're humiliated it's, uh, in 1956. And then uh, it's, it's very clear that they're losing world public opinion, and in particular, the Americans aren't interested in seeing this war go on because all they can see is all of North Africa turning into a Soviet sphere. So the French have to pull out. They resist. They overthrow the government. They put in a new government under Charles de Gaulle who was put in power to keep Algeria French and then betrays the public that put him in power. In 1961, he says, oh, I just have a slight revision to make to my former policy. My former policy is that we will not give up Algeria. The slight twist is, it's only a slight twist, we will now give up Algeria. <laughs> well, well, hey, Charles. Well, so now I do want to tell you, one million, over one million French people, you want to talk about an exodus, Leave Algeria for France. Now, if you go to France, they are all around. They and their children and their grandchildren, they are all around France, and each of them has a story. Their story is what I call the you know, reverse Pal uh, Palestinian story. They've got an, a vineyard that they owned, no, that they don't have anymore, an olive yard that they own, right? and that's the story. Right? They had a big, a beautiful apartment overlooking the beach in Algiers, what? It's all gone, and now the place has gone to ruin, and the whole thing, and they tell these stories. They left. And now, the Arabs are in charge, but the Maghreb isn't united. Libya ceases to be Italian in uh, uh, the Second World War. The British take it. After the war, the British interested in Libyan petroleum. Uh, 
control the government, but in 1969, a military officer, very much like Gamal Abdel Nasser, what, leads a rebellion. His name is Muammar Gaddafi, and now, <coughs> out with the British. And all of it's complicated by another thing. There is now discovered, as all of this war is taking place, that you can do more with this area than raise sheep and goats and grapes. There is oil huge reservoirs of oil in Algeria and in Libya, and now the Maghreb is independent, divided up, of course, into four states. What's going to happen to it? Well, if you want to find out, <laughs> come back in five minutes. Thank you. Let me talk about the last 30 years in uh, North Africa. Um, the only country of the four that kept its government was Morocco. Uh, Morocco had a monarchy that was established in the 17th century, the Alawite mo uh, monarchy, that is still there. And however, uh, it is only able to control the situation through severe repression. That is, there are political parties, uh, there are not free elections. And in fact, the opposition is uh, intimidated because when all the other places experienced rebellion, it was thought that maybe in Morocco they could overthrow the king too and establish a kind of new revolutionary Arab nationalist uh, regime, uh, but they didn't succeed. Uh, but in the other three, the governments were overthrown. And in two of them, the two that are the richest, there exists and still exists what we would call military government. So how do you get to military government? It's very simple. The people who fight the enemy organize themselves into a front uh, for national liberation. And they now organize a guerrilla army, right? and they now produce an army. The only force that represents the rebellion is an army. So when the enemy withdraws, all that remains is the army. And the army takes over. So in Algeria, the National Liberation Front declares itself the government of Algeria. and also declares that since Algeria is in danger, because after all, there are all these enemies surrounding it, they can't have more than one political party. So the National Liberation Front becomes the only political party. And the leaders, the military leaders of the rebellion now become the leaders. So, what is established from the very beginning is a kind of revolutionary government that we're familiar with in socialist countries in Eastern Europe. We believe in freedom and we'd love to give you freedom, you understand that. But we are in danger, so we what? We can't. It's only temporary, we want you to know. It may, it may last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, but, but it's only what? It's only temporary. So now Algeria and Libya fall into the hands of military leaders. Before they were guerrillas, do you understand? Now they're in charge. 
And once they achieve power, they don't want to give it up. Despite all the slogans. So since 1969 in Libya, there is this man called Muammar Gaddafi. And he has instituted, or instituted, a revolutionary regime. So let me talk about the revolutionary regime. One of the reasons why they have to have repression is the, the, these people, in order to rescue the economy and the people, whatever, need to go through a revolution. Well, if you have a revolution, you're going to have a lot of enemies, so counter-revolutionary, so we can't have freedom. Right? So both Algeria and Libya, number one. Socialism, because the only way to grow our business, our industry, and our economy, and remain in charge of it, is not to have foreign companies come in. We have to use our own resources. We have to own our own factories. All right, so socialism. The second is female liberation. Oh, good. Women should be free to go to the schools or whatever, the, hum, the, hum, the whole thing. Great. That's a revolution. Three, we have to tame the power of the clergy because, after all, uh, the clergy is backward, and we need to modernize ourselves in order to be strong, to keep the foreign powers out so that we can remain independent. Oh, that's Four, although we are Morocco, or we are Algeria, Libya, whatever it be, we are part of the greater Arab nation. So we want to tell you from the very beginning that we are committed not only to Algeria, we are committed to the Arab nation and the unification of the Arab nation ultimately. Now, in Libya, the revolution was very interesting. I, I was in Libya only for a short time. My plane on the way from Egypt to uh, Morocco landed in Tripoli, and they let me out of the airport. It was the early revolution. This was the early 1970s, and couldn't believe it, coming down the street is a band of women soldiers in green uniforms with rifles. Dum, dum, dum. Mm, that's interesting. That's a revolution, right? There wasn't a sign in anything but Arabic. They had determined they would not use any European language. I didn't know where the toilet was. I could not. <laughs> I'm, I'm, trying to find, I, I'm trying to find a sign. I mean, no. Arab nationalism, do you understand? And uh, everywhere there was the picture of the leader. His name was, and he was pretty handsome then, right? The name of the leader was Gaddafi and the whole thing. And so everything seemed to have been militarized because it was a revolution, right? And so everybody has to conform to the revolution. We can't have freedom right now. Right now we need conformity. Later on you're all going to get, you know what, you're all going to get freedom. So, so there it is. And in Algeria it was pretty much the same. And when it went to the oil, you take the oil, the ownership of the oil, away from the Western powers. But you don't have any people to run it. So now you have to make another deal with the oil companies whereby they will provide the management and the distribution, right? And they still make fairly decent profits, but a large part of the money now is given to the people. So now let me talk about the consequences. The consequences of it, of course, is that the promise of economic development failed because what it required was foreign investment. And another thing, 
clean management. So the millions and millions, if not billions of dollars made in the oil industry poured into the military government and very little of it was used to, it's one thing not to build a new infrastructure. The thing we encounter all the time in Michigan is the decay of the old infrastructure. Remember the potholes? You got, you got to main, maintain things. So the, the infrastructure that had been created by the French and the Italians now begins to fall apart. There, there's, not e there's no money for the new and there's no money for the, the maintenance. And the protest is inefficient. So now let me tell you about who are the best complainers. It's us. The best complainers in the world are the middle class. The best complainers. And in fact, uh, I mean, if there's going to be any change in China, it's going to come from what? The rising middle class. There's going to be a change in India. It's going to come from the rising middle class. So there's, no, there's, there's really, the middle class is now depressed. A large part of the middle class were French settlers in Algeria who left. So people are left to eat their slogans. And in fact, the economy declines. And it will be aggravated, certainly in the 80s and the early 90s, by the glut in the oil world. We should only have that glut now. I mean, there was a glut, no, there was. There was a glut in the oil world. And in fact, the price of oil uh, fell, which only aggravated whatever situation there was. So as things decline and people are repressed, is this what the revolution was all about? Well, the one thing they do have, by the way, is they have an Arab flag and they have what? An Arab government. And should that make them feel good? Well, if your agenda is only collective, then maybe. But if your agenda, if you're an individual trying to struggle to survive, I mean, you know, there's not much of a, of a compensation. So Libya and Algeria go down. In Morocco, where the government had not been overthrown, because the government had from the beginning been an Arab government, even though controlled by the French, what they allow into Morocco, Morocco chooses a different tack. Algeria and Libya choose the socialist uh, track, and they try to make maintain an alliance with lucky, 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 the Soviet Union. Morocco, on the other hand, fearing the revolution, the king of Morocco, decides to cozy up to the Americans. And the next thing you have is foreign investment and to the Europeans. And in addition, people called tourists arrive. Most people, if they've gone to the Maghreb, the only place they've gone to is where? Morocco. You, you can't go. If, to go to Algeria, I mean, The other place you may have gone to is a country in which there was a revolution, but in which the government decided basically to ally itself with the West and not with the Soviet Union. The name of the revolutionary leader was a man called Bourguiba. Uh, he, is in, he was in Tunis, right next to Carthage. And uh, so by allying himself with the Americans, he was able to get some kind of foreign investment. The economy was better in Tunisia than it was in Libya or in Algeria. So at the, at the bottom are Algeria and Libya in terms of what I call individual welfare. Then there is Tunisia, and then there is uh, uh, Morocco. Not terrific. So opposition groups emerge. Liberals who want more freedom. There aren't a lot of them, and the few that open their mouths are in jail. So, Another group are the people who want more free enterprise. Well, they're less threatening to the government. And in fact, as time goes on, 
uh, there are people in the government who realize they need some kind of foreign investment, but in order to do that, they have to suggest that if people invest their money in the country, it's what? A stable, a stable investment. The third group are the Bear Bears. Fine Arab nationalism, but we've lived here what? We were here before the Arabs. What, what, what about us? In fact, the French, when they were in control, played the Bear Bears against the Arabs. That was one of their ways. They, they, they played the, the Jews against the Arabs, and they played the, uh, the Bear Bears against uh, uh, the Arabs, but they're the Bear Bears. Got Arab nationalism? What about us? But the largest group that emerges because the economy is going to hell and a new voice arises. The people are still basically very religious. And the voice comes from their clergy, who have lost some of their power. And the clergy says, you know why we're in this trouble. We're in this trouble because we have abandoned the ways of our fathers. And the only way uh, for us to win is to go back to that. And in fact, the clergy now do what the state refuses to do, provide a welfare system. The welfare system's only on paper, not in reality. If you want a cup of soup, show up at the mosque. So the Islamic parties grow. In Libya, they're severely repressed. In Tunisia, they've grown. In Morocco, they've grown. And in Algeria, it produced the great crisis. So now comes the great crisis. And you're going to give me the answer. The great crisis was that uh, they go through a series of leaders in Algeria that come out of the National Liberation Front. First, a man called Ben Bella, and then he's replaced by a man called Boumediene, and then he's, after he dies, he's replaced by a man called Shedley. And Shedley decides, in order to win uh, some kind of support from America, because he can see the Soviet Union is falling apart, in 1988, decides to rewrite the Constitution and to allow for free elections. Oh. So, political parties organize, and now they're going to have a free election. And in 1990, they have a free election. And the party that wins the overwhelming majority of the vote is the fundamentalist Muslim party, who is encouraging every woman to put back her veil, do the honor of the law. They win! And they won in a democratic election. And I pointed this out before. When you talk about bringing democracy to the Middle East, if you have democracy, they most likely will vote in fundamentalism. So then, the National Liberation, the, the army now has a what? A problem. Do we allow these people to take over the government? The answer, what's your answer? Do I hear a yes from all the Democrats with a small d in the room? The answer is no. So now the, our, the army intervenes, again, do you understand, to cancel the election and to reassert military rule. Because if you're a female liberationist, you want the army to do that. And if you're interested in any kind of what we call modern Western uh, style of living, you want the army to do that. So they do that. And what now breaks out in Algeria is the terrible civil war in which It's, it's difficult to estimate. The estimates run from 40,000 to 110,000 people who were killed. Have you heard the stories? The Islamicists, the Muslim guerrillas, enter small towns. Their whole purpose is simply to terrorize. They don't care whom they arrest. They take the whole town and they slit their throats, men, women, and children. Their pictures were in the newspaper all the time. It's a terrible enemy. So the military government now tries to go after them, and uh, they do. 
and they have increasing support from the people because the people now fear the terrorists. So now in Algeria, they've tried democracy again. They held another election, and surprise, the army man won. His name is Bouteflika, and he, there, he, there he is, he's, he's won. Was it a free election? Well, foreign observers seem to think that it was a fairly free election. Have the Algerians grown tired of these crazy terrorists? I mean, whatever it is. All I can say to you is, and uh, it's not good news, is that the economy is still where it was. So the, the main answer in the Maghreb for coping with this is very simple. We leave Detroit for the weather. They leave Algeria, Tunisia, do you understand, Morocco, for jobs. Where do they go? Other parts of the Arab world, they are part of the Arab nation, that's where they'll go. Wrong. Many of them are, speak French. The place they go to is France. So now if you want to see a large part of the population of Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco, you don't have to go to Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco. You just have to go to the Champs-Élysées. The last time I was in the Champs-Élysées, th 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 there were no French. The numbers, I mean, the, the North Africans now constitute close to five million people in France out of a total population of 50 million, one out of every 10. And it won't stop. And they go to Italy. So that's their main coping strategy. What remains in the Maghreb today is still overwhelming poverty. Theoretical independence. A lot of repression. And a lot of emigration. So now let me tell you about where the Maghreb is moving. It used to be the case that the Maghreb only included Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. It now includes Paris. <laughs> no, no, I, I, no, what I'm saying is, you know, because if you look at it, actually, North, the Maghreb is the Mexico of Europe. And in fact, it will not stop. There has been one interesting change and it's the one positive thing that President Bush can point to when he talks about the Iraq War. One of the consequences of the Iraq War was that an aging military person with a fairly unstable personality by the name of Muammar Gaddafi, who used to scream terrible things against the Americans, the Western world, the whole thing, the great champion of Arab nationalism who's going to take the place of Gamal Abdel Nasser. A few months ago, who can believe it? Was it a shot? Says, I've changed my mind, he said. I now realize that opposing the United States of America doesn't work. And I simply want billions and billions and billions of American and European dollars to flow into my country to transform it, and I'll pay all those people with Lockerbie and the home and the, the plane, the whole thing. I'm a nice guy, and tourists, please come. Was it a nervous breakdown? So the one positive sign, <laughs> if you regard it as positive, is that Gaddafi either has gone crazy or he has seen the, the light. 
But I do want to tell you that if I were living in Algiers today, I most likely would get a ticket. <laughs> no, no, no. I would buy a ticket to, to it, it's very interesting, and I find this interesting. The French left so that the Arabs could keep their land. And now the Arabs are following <laughs> the French <laughs> back to, uh, back to France. What, what is the answer? Well, right now, with the danger of what I call Muslim fundamentalism, getting rid of repressive government most likely is not, is not possible. And so long as the present management system exists with this repressive government, reviving the economy is highly unlikely. So the one lucky thing they have that keeps them going, and I wish I had it in my backyard, I hope you have it in your backyard, <laughs> it's called oil. Thank you very, very, very much.